Okay, hi, good evening everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. It, it's normal to have someone introduce you. And I've done it before and you just kind of look up their CV online and kind of read it out. And if you want to do that, you can look at the AA uh, website or LinkedIn. So I'm going to stand over here to introduce myself and then over here to give the lecture. So I thought maybe it's better if I say um, why I came to the AA and what's kept me here and why I'm so interested in the city, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. I came here quite by accident. I was a chief draftsman, such a thing doesn't exist anymore, for the Jedi Master Plan, uh, working for Louis Sert a few blocks away, and someone brought me here for lunch, and there were some very weird drawings, which I didn't understand at all. And when I asked someone what they were about, I didn't understand that either. And three weeks later, I was in first year. So, um, and I wasn't alone. There were many people who kind of drifted into the AA like that. And what's kept me here is, in the best part, being amongst people who have ideas and passions that last them a lifetime. And I developed my interests that I had, that I brought in to school with me through conversations within the AA. And for all of my life, and I still am, I'm puzzled as how we got to where we are, and I'm really curious about where we're going. So I'm going to start. The dream speculations and projections are about the city. And I have to move over here. Uh, this is uh, a quote from uh, a writer I love very much, Levi Strauss. And for me, this is the most important thing, that the city is both a real thing and an imaginary thing. And it's something that we live and something that we dream about. And I want to start here in 1914 with the new city. And I think the next 25 or 30 slides are all about different people in a 30-year period describing what they thought is, will be the new city in various timescales. This is Santilia. What he's talking about is, is a city that constantly needs reinventing. And he said, and I'll return at the very end, that every generation must invent its own city. 1922, uh, Santilia was 24 when he wrote that, by the way. Uh, most of you, many of you are around 24, 25 years old, and he was like you. A um, little bit later, we, uh, Corp starts in 1922 with an idea for a city for three million people. It's got tw the towers in the center. There's some kind of interesting illogicalities. The little white cross in the center is the airport as well as the kind of city center. It's supposed to be a huge transportation center. There are multiple levels, although he never drew them. Um, and out here on the periphery, the lower blocks is where most of us would be, maybe Carlos would be kind of in the center. Centrist for the elite. So it started the idea of a very dense city with the elite at the center. A little bit later, uh, he's actually commissioned um, by an automobile company to kind of rework it uh, and place it in Paris. And the idea gets reduced to, never mind the workers on the periphery, we'll just talk about the elite in the center and the towers. Two years later, this is Hilbersheimer, very important figure uh, after the war in Chicago, uh, in the US here. He's a good socialist, not yet a capitalist. And he's talking about the vertical city, multiple layers, pedestrian levels, all the transport is contained in those kind of little holes underneath. Um, but the kind of slightly scary part that we begin to see really early in the 20th century is ideas about density. These are 50, 15 story blocks. They're 600 meters long. They're almost 100 meters high. Uh, 
Francisco Mujica is not very well known, but in 1929, uh, he published a book which was uh, supposedly uh, about the history of skyscrapers, although there weren't very many skyscrapers by then. Um, but this principal idea that you begin to see here of large masses, concentrations of density, raised decks, and just below you can just about see it, these massive flow spaces or transportation arteries. Ferris wasn't an architect, although he wanted to be. He drew almost everybody else's architecture. Some of these drawings are enormous. If you ever get to see them, some of them are almost the height of this room. Beautiful done in charcoal. But what we're seeing on the far right is, it is 1929, he's calling it the metropolis of tomorrow. We're seeing, again, the same concentration of flow spaces, massive densities, very large buildings concentrated around them. Whilst architects started to talk about this and they captured the imagination, very different reaction in other aspects of the culture. Uh, this is from 1927. It's a Metropolis film. Many of you will know it. If you don't, you can download it and get it online these days. The city is a vast machine. And this is arguably the first kind of dystopian anxiety that a culture is expressing. It's a massive machine. The workers are no longer on the periphery, they're actually underground. And again, we're seeing the concentration of the elite and the beginning of a kind of ideological battle of class and race. And if you were a young architect in 1927, you'd have been working on it because there was no work in offices. And most of the sets for this and successive films that I'm going to show over some slides for were built by young architects, people your kind of age and actually with a very similar haircut to uh, some of the people. It has one other aspect that's interesting and we become, uh, it becomes very important later on is the eroticization of technology. Technology becomes sexy. The first expression here of uh, the robot. And there's one other thing that maybe you won't have noticed. That the villain, the supreme evil person in this city is the architect. This is the first kind of voice again, or the beginnings of a feeling amongst other aspects of culture that maybe some of the, the dreams of architects are not quite uh, in line with, or they're arousing fears as well as aspirations. There's a very interesting film, it's hard to get hold of, uh, called Just Imagine. It's the first ever movie, people like it, because it's the first musical sci-fi. Um, and pretty much what you can see here is the city we have today. It's pretty much fully formed. Okay. All of the cities we've talked about so far, people were projecting between 20 and 50 years in the future. Nearly all of the people who wrote those manifestos and made those drawings were young. This is called Things to Come. It's actually, it's a film in 1936, but originally it was a book by H.G. Wells. Um, and the, the book is about a story that's one century long. He's anticipated uh, three de decades of war, World War II, complete ruin of civilization, pestilence, plague, anarchy, and a world that would be rebuilt uh, by polymaths. And everybody in the city would be a polymath. He never quite says, what happens to people who aren't quite so clever? Uh, what happens to us who can do some things but not everything else? But nonetheless, there's a great deal of, in the imagery and in the sets, again, designed and worked on by young architects. Uh, and the image projected, of course, you see Blade Runner and many other films much later. At the same time of these dreams, the events of the 1930s were in, let's say in the domains outside of architecture, were referred to as the dirty 30s. Great environmental disaster in the US. Uh, wind storms and dust storms eroded the land, 
this great writer Steinbeck, uh, if you read any of his novels, who describes his fleeing from the land, the destruction of towns, destructions of villages. What's kind of less commented on then, and is beginning to be understood now, that nearly all of that was uh, human fault. Strange agricultural practices that didn't take account of wind direction, um, farming techniques that were completely inappropriate for the location. The mass migration in the U.S. was, apart from when the U.S. And, uh, was settled and people unrolled across the continent, this is, a, apart from that, this is the largest movement of people over a 10-year period the U.S. has ever experienced. And it still has echoes today uh, in their ideologies and in their culture. This is from 1936. So whilst the, the dreams of new cities were needed, People were building new cities in the US. Most of what we see as ideas of the contemporary city, what we're going to see around us, I will show later, most of it was built within uh, over a 50 year period. But at the same time, it's aroused, beginning to arouse very considerable fears in the population. Frank Lloyd Wright, and both, uh, this is, he called this a disappearing city in his first book. 1932. Uh, Broadacre City is, I think, uh, three or four years later. Uh, it was first made as a model for uh, an exhibition at the Rockefeller Center, and later uh, he kind of theorized it and redrew some parts. And it's a 10 kilometer square community. It's got some interesting features that are it's, it's an agrarian society, there's no separation between the cultivated land and the city, none at all. There's no boundary, there's no borders, it goes on forever. It's ordered by a grid and a transportation network, as we've seen in many of the earlier ones. And the only person he thought suitable to run these kind of set these settlements was an architect. Himself, really, but uh, he couldn't do all of them, so the rest would be run by architects. But the idea that I want to emphasize in this is the idea of the endless city, in this case, city countryside thing, hybrid, that is bound, boundless. It has no boundaries. It has no differentiation anywhere except local. And this is one of the early models. He also said something interesting about skyscrapers, because he said city people, the proper place for a skyscraper is in the country with some land around it. Right. He also said, um, because if you put them all together in cities, it causes terrible problems. He never was quite specific about what they were. But he also said city people may need a period of adjusting to, to this new uh, world that he was imagining and projecting. And so for a while they could live in the tower until they got used to the distributed uh, agrarian city, and then they could move uh, further out or downwards and out. Okay. Um, the War of the Worlds. There are several reasons why I think this is kind of crucial uh, text and film. The original novel is actually 1899. It's set in a kind of little quiet Surrey province uh, in England. <laughs> uh, there have been several films made of it. I think Tom Cruise is one of the later ones. But perhaps most famously uh, was the radio broadcast by Orson Welles. The principle of the story is that the cities and towns are invaded by uh, these kind of alien walkers. The strange thing, this is an ancient drawing, the walker, this kind of robot alien walker, becomes a dominant figure in archigram and uh, you'll see later in, in many of the other kind of imaginations of, of the future city. The terrible thing for humans is that they're forced to live in the world. They can't live in cities and towns anymore, they have to evacuate. However, they're saved by the aliens are not immune to a virus that humans are immune to. And this becomes an interesting point. So. I think this was in 1936. Um, 
and it's a 60-minute play, but the first two-thirds of it are presented as though it was real news and made an enormous impact, uh, partly because Orson Welles has an amazing dramatic uh, voice, but also people really believed it was happening uh, and right across the US. Why anyone would believe such an illogical thing is kind of curious, and there are many psychoanalytic discussions about that. Uh, maybe not for tonight. This is the world of tomorrow where it starts to get funded. So we've got about a 20-year period from the first uh, setting out of the ideas, the first publications, the beginnings of some films, funded by General Motors. Um, was by Geddes, who was kind of serious planner and, and architect. And he was proposing, more or less, he took all the ideas that he could find from the previous 20 years and kind of rolled them out. Uh, it's remote-controlled, free-flowing highways, um, power plants, farms, artificial production uh, of food, rooftop platforms, uh, and so forth. And it was an enormous exhibit. It must have cost a fortune to make. And you can see this is from uh, the exhibition at the World uh, Trade Fair. A more formal, more architectural, it's very close to the kind of models and representations we would make today. Um, and you can see many of the, the ideas that had first appeared as kind of speculative drawings are now being paid for exhibited in New York, which was one of the best attended uh, fairs. And much of what was proposed there was built. Not exactly as in the model, but every element within the model was built. Geddes was also proposing an endless network of superhighways. And some of the publications that he made and he wrote are, are really quite amazing. Um, this is the thing a little further out from, from the center, um, from GM. Uh, I really love this one because every little tree's got a kind of glass dome over it, a bit like my auntie used to have with a, on her mantelpiece was a kind of glass dome with some funky bits inside. Um, and I, the, the sentence is extraordinary. Strange, fantastic, unbelievable. Remember, this is the world of 1960. So by 1940, all the ideas of a contemporary city were present. Everything that was going to be built over the next 60 years, all the ideas were present, had been modeled, drawn, thought about, discussed at political levels with high-level corporations, General Motors, and many others. Most of them had all somewhere in them an ideology of social liberation. Even the Geddes one is he was convinced and that, uh, they were fighting against tenement buildings, the oppressions of the poor. It was seen and thought of as for social liberation. And there was a kind of a euphoria about new technologies. Cities were multiple layers, separated through transport and zoning. And the two bottom sentences are crucial for what comes next. There were no boundaries to the city. It was going to be endless. It was going to occupy the earth. Nobody actually said that then. You have to wait until the 1960s before we get uh, architects talking like that. And agriculture is urbanized. Hilbert Simon emigrated to the US, became a good US citizen. Uh, he did actually some very good work on the Chicago Master Plan. Good capitalist now. Uh, talking with uh, capitalist funders. But he also published in 1944 um, a kind of pamphlet of designs called The Decentralized City. For the life of me, I haven't been able to find the decentralized bit. And believe me, I've looked. Um, again, you can see in these kind of drawings and images, <coughs> there is a landscape. There's bits of it are untouched. And what looks like a large rectangular section of a city has been taken out and dropped into it. Um, and when you look closely, we can see all the things that we've seen before. Corbusier, we can see the density of blocks. There are some height gradations, but the central spine of 
flow and transportation organizes all this. This was 1944, it was in, in wartime. And what was going on were new organizations. This is an uh, image from the Tokyo Firestorm. It was, the physics was worked out um, by a union of British and American scientists, how to set a city on fire. Um, they also invented new ways. I'm not going to take a moral stance on this. These are this slide and the next one, Hiroshima. New ways of increasing the destruction of cities. So at the same time as we're beginning to, uh, society, civilization is producing more and more cities, we're also seeing increasingly inventive ways of removing them. What was it like to be an architect? Where, where did this come from? What happened after 1945? Well, for those of you about between age 25 and 30 in this room, if you were as you are now in 1945, you'd have been sitting here or some room like this, and your big project would have been rebuilding the cities. And mainly you would have been concerned with social housing. Um, however, My duty as your dean to say you'll never become an architect. I am an architect. Okay, this is a very, very important book, uh, The Fountainhead. This is the first big cultural representation. Uh, the book is 1943, the film is uh, 1949, of the architect as an artist. It's the first time there is no social collective ambitions. It's the first representation of the architect as an individual, and the emphasis is on his artistic integrity. And interestingly, that integrity is only focused on the outside of the building. And this is the terrible thing he's fighting about. A terrible event for, for, um, that he designed this skyscraper, and the firm he worked <laughs> for, and the client had got someone else in to stick these things, a bit of Greek stuff on the outside and at the bottom. And the story goes that uh, he, he was so incensed by this, he, he left and he went and worked in a, the actor was very handsome, but in the story also a very handsome man, he went and worked in a quarry, uh, drilling rocks and kind of, um, kind of lone, very masculine hero. And at when the building was almost finished, he broke into the building site at night with dynamite and he blew it up. And the book has had various kind of resurgences in American culture uh, and is, is kind of being re-looked at and re-examined today because it is always a discussion uh, in the book, Anne Rand's book on the right to an individual and their artistic production, their integrity against the social and collective needs of society and, and that um, should I, they don't mention, I, and doesn't say this, but pretty much the argument is around, is architecture something you do with other people for other people, or is it a personal expression of your artistic genius? Okay, so again, just after the war, these are, this is the Unite, it's Corb. Uh, 1946, and he was playing with the same ideas, I think, until 1952, and pretty much for the rest of his life in one form or another. And he, we call them the Habitation, but he thought of this as a vertical city. Everything that he thought was important in a city is inside the building. It doesn't matter what the exterior context is. This could be anywhere. The Marseille one isn't very different uh, to the one in northern France, even though the climate and culture and topography are radically different. It's 12 floors, it's got apartments, schools, offices, workshops and playgrounds. And actually, it's sort of horrifying in its idea, but actually if you go there, it's great. And this is the kind of ambivalence that, that, that I, I want to be pointing out to you. That, Many of the things that we see are really convincing in some way, but they also have a meaning for society that is detrimental. But 
Um, you can stay in one of these. I've been, you can stay for two or three days and live in one of the apartments and they're really nice. And if you get to the right one, it's got a lovely staircase by Prouvé. Um, the English took this on. Um, <laughs> This is the English version many years later. It's, uh, <coughs> we're in the 1960s now. Um, and of course, almost like everything else in English urbanism and, and uh, like our present government, the idea was to do it as cheaply as possible and stack them high. Um, this is severed completely from any context. It's almost impossible to get to it even when it was built. It's surrounded by really, really busy roads. The so-called garden space then is filled with hydrocarbon fumes from uh, the uh, yeah, lorries and cars. It's practically like a medieval castle. It's got a, the equivalent of a moat around it. But it was presented as a utopian social housing. It's a little bigger and a little meaner than the habitation. The spaces are a little smaller. The street, internal street's not quite as good, and so forth. 1960 is when the metabolist movement comes. And this is kind of a reworking of the ideas that we're already familiar with. The central spine of organization. Actually, this thing is 80 kilometers long. We always see this and when we look it up in a book, this little bit. And for years, I thought, yeah, well, it's quite nice to connect, <coughs> connecting one side of the bay to the other. But actually, that thing goes from there, from Tokyo all the way to Yokohama. And it has nine kilometer long modules. And in that layered spine is, as we've seen in previous things, the cars and subways and trains and railway trains. The, the pedestrians are at the upper level. But it has, for the first time, a kind of humanization of that idea. Regrettably, it doesn't seem to impact very far uh, into the later 20th century. So although these are government presences, there are uh, uh, parks and gardens, seaports and, and leisure centers, and so forth. However, they're for the elite. Um, and for most ordinary people, you know, they've been out on the far periphery, out on the bay. These intermediary ones, there's mixed um, reports and descriptions of what they for, were for. In the first drawings, they're called temples of consumption. Later on, they become housing. Um, and they're kind of A-frames that people could colonize on the inside. Metabolist ideas were very influential in urbanism. And the metabolist movement continually reworked this plan and added to it uh, in many different ways. By the end of the 60s, we get Super Studio. Uh, this is called the Continuous Monument, an architectural model for total urbanization. So this is a grid that marches right across the world, across every landscape and every kind of topography through and above cities. The argument they put that inside this seemingly uniform grid, anything can happen. But when you research, you can never find an interior. The Super Studio did not produce any interiors for this. Instead, what we see are very evocative uh, drawings, uh, very beautiful in some ways and, and kind of moving. Uh, but it's an idea that everybody, that people have no fixed place. They're endless, they're nomads, they're endlessly wandering across this surface. And I think this is one of the most bizarre uh, drawings that, that I see. Uh, it has this very, very peculiar uh, breaking of the surface. This is the hippie version. Uh, those of you at my age will have been very familiar with that, those kind of clothes and hairstyles and things. But again, it's the idea, nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody can wonder, everybody's a play. Nobody lives in one place, nobody works. Um, and perhaps uh, the most profoundly disturbing, although it was presented as irony, was Archizum. This is called a no-stop city. Uh, has no boundaries. This one is all interior, has got no exterior. Um, everything is artificially lit. Uh, I don't think they had much in the way of air conditioning, but 
what they, the argument was that uh, they were imagining an amorphous structure. Utopian content is not to do with quality, but is to do with the number of repetitions of events. And what you see in the development of that is something that um, in one way is kind of beautifully drawn, I, I, and I love the drawings, and in another way is kind of psychologically and perceptually very disturbing vision of the... Uh, and there's a curious inversion happening by now, that all the ideas that were uh, in some sense present have been turned in on themselves. And architecture's beginning to lose its audience and its authority. And these were very well received ideas by other architects. They were published, it's the start of the growth of the architectural publication and the start of, um, which we're all familiar with, uh, Architects produce and consume the highest number of books of any discipline. Um, and they're like toilet paper. Because I have books from the 60s, uh, which are damp and rotten, and it drives my wife and family crazy because I'm trying to store them, and they say, why are you keeping them? I never look at them. There are huge numbers. I think I had over 3,000, and I was forced to have a cull and throw them away. And when I looked at them, I couldn't even remember why they were so important. We consume ideas. <coughs> and this is the beginning of what you might call the architect's media sphere. It's the beginning of a construction of a sphere of like-minded or like similarly interested people. And like the drawings and the ideas that they have about a city, there's very little external reference. I have to be careful what I say because Carlos is here, he's a very knowledgeable situationist. Um, I'm not going to talk Carlos about situations, but constant. This is New Babylon. Uh, I think it's 56. It predates just uh, the situationists. And there's some positive things to say about it, but if you'll forgive me, I'm going to concentrate on uh, some of the aspects that alarm the rest of the world. The worldwide city for the future. Positively, it's fully automated. The land is owned collectively. Like Super Studio, they imagine a world where no one works and everybody plays, where no one lives in one place and everybody moves permanently. And Lefebvre pointed out it was called New Babylon, which is a very provocative name uh, for constant to choose because in the Protestant tradition, Babylon was the city of evil, a cursed city. Uh, this, again, very beautiful drawing. This is 1967, uh, Rudolph in the US. Uh, it's, uh, he was dean of the Yale School of Architecture at the time, and he was commissioned by the Ford Foundation, again, uh, motor, motor cars, to do a study and make a series of designs for the Lower Manhattan Expressway. It's a mega structure. It has uh, a number of uh, ways of plugging in prefabricated uh, apartments. You can't see in these drawings, but somewhere in the text is an idea about people movers, travel ways, of, uh, like flat escalators, if you can say such a thing, um, and periodically has towers. The publication of this drawing started an epic fight with Jane Jacobs. Uh, and those of you who know about Jane Jacobs, she was for the local, for kind of what nowadays we call bottom-up processes for occupying spaces in the city with gardens and small shops for communities, a very different view of uh, what a city is for. And this was to go through, I think, where, near where she lived in Greenwich Village, uh, was just going to go right through it. And the big argument eventually that she won is, despite its kind of architectural qualities as a megastructure, it divides the city in a way that's impossible to, to cross or to reconcile with what she was arguing was urban life. We see a much more playful version of this in England. Plug-in city. It's still a megastructure. It's kind of, in a sense, slightly, or well, it doesn't look it, in the argument they're saying it's less fixed because the cranes can kind of dissemble bits and add new bits 
it's, it was presented as it was a more or less constant state of being reshuffled and reorganized. The curious thing about this is, first of all, it doesn't seem to end anywhere. And everything arrives from outside it in a pipe. When you look closely at the drawing and the supporting drawings, there's a pipe that's labeled food, materials, electricity. Just this little pipe in the corner. And similarly, the idea, it's, it's for transients. Ron Heron, I think, was a very interesting guy. He was here for a long time, uh, as was Peter Cook. Um, and many of us, the older people, kind of were taught a little bit by Ron when he could be bothered. Most of the time, he couldn't. This is 1964. And for him, well, of course, people can move around, but it's much more interesting if you can get the kind of walking to the city to walk around. And he was arguing uh, in a time when there weren't really the ideas or the words for smart cities and, and um, embedded intelligence, that this was an intelligent robotic structure. It could make up its own mind where it was going to go. It could freely roam the world. It could go wherever it could find if it needed minerals or it needed resources. And eventually, all these walking cities could kind of self-organize, again, not a word used then, self-organize themselves into kind of larger metropolises. This was called uh, City in the Image of Man, and is both a kind of brilliant thing and a piece of great sadness. Uh, it's Soleri. He spent his whole life on this idea. He has built, without any resources at all, a piece of a thing in the desert. And he was the first person to make this word archaeology, a mixture of architecture and ecology. He was never really able to free himself of the kind of inherited architectural culture that I've been briefly discussing of the machine. So his archaeologies are closed to the outside. They're completely self-contained. They have no relation to context in that they're not embedded with or in some, some kind of symbiosis with the fields or the streams or the rivers or forests around it. Most of them are buried or partially buried. Um, this, nobody quite knows whether this is a personal preference or a kind of obsession. Certainly, he had a formidable character. Um, and if you, for the small pieces that are built in the uh, desert in Arizona, I think it is, um, or Cosanti, it's called, it's uh, worth kind of looking up and, and reading about it for, in one sense, he's the the best side of the architect as an individual pursuing a kind of slightly mad dream for all of his life. Um, and the ideas are amazing, even if the manifestation of these closed machines is not. Um, nearly all of these are, have a vertical organization. Uh, they're self-sufficient. Um, this is actually from Arcosanti, some of his drawings from Arcosanti. The, there are enormous drawings done in the days with rotaring pens. It must have taken weeks and weeks for people to produce them. There are some kind of interesting models that you can see. Again, he's arguing for a linear city of infinite extension. And as it marches across the landscape, the landscape outside it can do whatever it wants. Inside, it's a kind of organized garden. There aren't really any ideas, although there are labels on drawings, about the relationship of the amount of surface for producing uh, crops or anything. They're all quite pretty in the drawings if you see these kinds of things. So with that, there's no mathematics or science uh, involved in his, his version of that. Nonetheless, he was intensely involved in the idea, uh, which I think he was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. And he worked for a long time and is still working on using clay and local materials to produce. So Arcosanti is built more or less from local material. <coughs> Excuse me. Meanwhile, we were getting on with inventing new ways of uh, fixing the world. This is Agent Orange, 1964 to 1971. 
20 million gallons of a new mixture of a herbicide and a genetic mutation inducing chemical. Vietnam, Eastern La Laos, parts of Cambodia. Estimated there were 5 million acres or 20,000 square kilometers were destroyed. They were mainly forests, uh, mangrove forests, uh, and millions of acres of crops. For, well, I won't go into the justification. Uh, it's had a multi-generational effect. We're in the third generation now of birth defects. It's estimated hundreds of thousands of birth defects. And most of the land is still unusable. Can't grow anything on it. And this is an image taken uh, at the, uh, late in the Vietnam War. Whilst this was happening, this was Peter Cook, the Arcadian city. And the curious thing, Peter is talking, and in his text, he's talking about kind of bacteria, buildings dissolving, things being reconfigured, figured like he keeps using the word bacteria and so forth. So. In a way, I think this is the argument I want to put to you, that architects have sometimes a unique ability to fix on the thing that society needs or is noticed. And in the second half of the 20th century, they almost always get it asked backwards because they're reworking and repeating ideas from the first half of the 20th century. And each repetition becomes slightly weaker and as we say, denatured, that's not to do with, it, it's um, not to do with nature, but it's stripping out all of the original context from it. This is an English river valley. Again, an inhabitation for an Arcadian, if you know the idea of Arcadia in the literature, it's very ancient of a, a, a playground of perfect being in harmony with nature. At the same time, his rhetoric is about destruction, erosion, mutation by bacteria, infection. Arguably, the most important book, uh, or the one with the greatest impact in the second half of the 20th century is Neuromancer. Lots of reasons, William Gibson is very famous. Uh, he was the guy who said, uh, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. But he also invented the word cyberspace. This is the first time it's used in this book. And he calls it a consensual hallucination. And it's experienced daily by billions of people. And it's a, a representation, three-dimensional representation of data that's abstracted from every computer in the human system. And it has unthinkable complexity. And there's a quote, lines of light ranged in the non-space of the mind, clusters and constellations of data like city lights receding. And the influence on that we're starting to see today has been um, on ideas about the smart city. We've seen it in urbanism. We've seen hybrid versions of this in many books and films. And I'll return to that towards the end. This is Levius Woods. Levius. Great draftsman. I don't think he ever built anything, but for my generation, Levius was the most famous uh, architectural uh, um, artist, in a way. He was the equivalent of Hugh Ferris in, in the 30s. Probably even more influential. Uh, Zaha always used to make fun of him. Um, he was kind of odd and interesting, strange character. This is a drawing for inhabiting, uh, it's called Quake City. It's a whole series of drawings in San Francisco post-earthquake. Levius was obsessed for most of his life with what happens to a city after a disaster. Uh, there's a very moving personal blog. Uh, and towards the end of his life, he moved to Sarajevo. And he spent, uh, I think, almost 10 years in and out of Sarajevo. In the last three years of his life, he, he lived in Sarajevo during the the worst of the, uh, the war. Nonetheless, his architectural ideas are these kind of ramshackle, slightly strange constructions. Um, and there's a very unfortunate kind of echo that we hear today with uh, Bannon, who, those of you who are interested in those kind of things, is 
the so-called brain behind Trump, uh, and we have the equivalent kind of person here. It's, it's an argument that goes back to the Anne Rand to the 1930s that great things come out of destruction, potentially. Um, and so nearly all of his drawings are about the inhabitation with these odd forms and spaces from salvaged materials into damaged buildings. And some of them are, you know, truly amazing. They're also highly influential. Many of the things you see built, many of the representations and the buildings that you've seen, this constructivism and all those kind of things, owe more than a simple debt to this. Some of them are direct copies from some of his drawings. Um, nonetheless, he wasn't particularly, he didn't really have any theories about how anyone would use them or live in them. He just liked the f shapes and the materials and the principal idea. And the walking machine kind of reappears in a lot of his work. This is just two examples. But nearly always in his work, you can see this kind of the walking machine from re rethinking or reinventing uh, from the war of the worlds. But pretty much it's the same kind of robotic device that in his case, I think he's drawn one person kind of vaguely inside this, um, that you could kind of live in these and kind of walk away or walk through the disasters. At the same time that was happening, we were seeing a very different set of ideas in um, more popular culture, both in literature and in film. Architectural discourse by this time was entirely within schools of architecture, magazines, exhibitions, with very little uh, public acceptance. Or I'd like to share a revelation that I've had during my time here. It came to me when I tried to classify your species, and I realized that you're not actually mammals. Every mammal on this planet instinctively develops a natural equilibrium with the surrounding environment, but you humans do not. You move to an area and you multiply and multiply until every natural resource is consumed. And the only way you can survive is to spread to another area. There is another organism on this planet that follows the same pattern. Do you know what it is? A virus. The human beings are a disease, a cancer of this planet. You are a plague, and we are the cure. Uh, many of you would know this. It's the Matrix. Here's Agent Smith. Of course, he's pure information. Curious information. So in that sense, it's connected and it grew out very directly from Neuromancer and uh, William Gibson, who was marginally involved in this. But it's also the first expression, it, it, broadly in culture, not in science, but in broad culture, that humans have some culpability in the destruction of the natural world. Architects are not talking about this at the same time has not penetrated any architectural discourse, but it's already beginning to be embedded in literature and particularly in film, that humans are a part of uh, the disasters in the world that are beginning to occur. And it's also not entirely uh, dystopian. There's always some hope in this if you know the stories. So uh, where are we after 1999? This is what became of Broadacre. This is flying into uh, Los Angeles. Every man to his own acre. The plots are now less than a quarter acre. An endless carpet. So we built the continuous city. We have these enormous flowing structures for endless movement. Motor car. The inversion of the city into the uh, urban block or the solitary building that's not connected, let's say. This is um, the Smithsons, this is what it is now. Great fight by architects to preserve this, uh, try to get it listed as a heritage building, and everybody else saying, what the fuck, why do you want to keep that? 
Um, I don't know what the status of the battle is now. Uh, and I'm in two minds myself. I kind of love it and hate it at the same time. This is Mexico City, uh, one of many famous images of the, what I would say is the endless city. And we built those dreams. And they're not totally without qualities in some spaces, but they are undifferentiated and they don't acknowledge their place or their climate or the topography. And even more scary, this is Delhi. Is anybody here from Delhi? I don't want to say anything too personal about it. Um, and you can see a tiny spot of green there, just one. And Hilbert Simon's 1920s dream, this is China today. And a great number of people in a great many cities live in towers. And there are people in this school, and I've met many in uh, MTech and in my other teaching when I was in undergrad, who grew up in these towers with a 30-floor journey to the ground and no social provisions, no corner store, nowhere where granny sits. Um, smoking her cigar or whatever she does. Um, and the space between them progressively smaller and smaller. And something kind of quite scary, this is uh, Kowloon, sometimes called the City of Darkness. It was only 200 meters long, and I think 120 <coughs> on the other side, 14 stories, and 33,000 people lived in it. That works out to something like 1 million people per square kilometer. I think unheard of densities. And I saw it as a child. My, my father uh, took me to see it. He wasn't really interested in architecture, but he thought it was kind of socially interesting. Um, some of the co uh, contemporary. And the kind of interesting thing, no architects were involved in the evolution of this. It started just as a series of small 12-story um, uh, towers, uh, quite cheaply made. And over a 40-year period, all the connections and additions were made by people who lived in it. And in the end, it got so dense, there was no light, it, you couldn't reach the ground, uh, except in the center part. And uh, reputedly, you could pass from one side of the block to the other without ever touching the ground. I don't know if this is true. It, but when I, as a child, was taken there by my father, he was in the army, uh, with we went with military police. It was, nobody could go inside without permission. So it was, you know, in some sense it's still argued there was a tremendous sense of community in this space. I believe partly because they modified and, and built it themselves. Uh, it's another kind of image from, uh, this is from one of the outer surfaces of it. There are some strange films about it with holes cut in walls and people making, um, various kinds of foods and laundries and the kind of very ad hoc occupation. In some sense, that's the lived version of what we saw with Akizum and some of the other uh, cities. But a great significant fraction of the world lives here and not there. And we should remember this. That the cost of this computer and this talk, and my iPhone, and my glasses, right? I'm no different to anyone else, is this. That the rare earths that are mined for it leave toxin in the landscape that have a half-life of over 500 years, impossible for humans to ever inhabit uh, these territories without genetic mutations. We continue to find ways to destroy our cities. This is Syria. We have whole new ways. This is from Chernobyl, the ne nearest big city to Chernobyl. Still uninhabitable, although I think you can take a tour there now. I think you can go on holiday, kind of stay somewhere slightly safe, and they drive you in there. And there's an amazing film by Tarkovsky uh, uh, about, called Stalker, which has a forbidden territory zone, which is very mysterious and very difficult to get into, and you need these kind of stalkers to guide you in there and, and die. And, it, the, these disasters are also always present with the utopian dream. 
And of course, we produce whole new ways of poisoning uh, our atmosphere and ourselves. And we produce an enormous waste. Um, without going too far to this, it's estimated that we use about one and one third times of the Earth's resources every year now. So it has a finite limit. It's going to end. Um, and we have whole new problems of how to dispose of these. And these are not egalitarian. The dismembering of these ships, which also are filled with toxins, uh, is in the poorest parts of the world. And the survival time for um, young men, principally, who work on this, is into their middle 30s. And this is going back to medieval lifespans. And nobody knows how to leach out or clean the toxins in the sand uh, and in the land near these places. There are times when natural disasters create such an overwhelming situation, such as Katrina uh, and St. Louis, where governments and institutions are forced to start to rethink uh, and we begin to see around this time quite serious architects beginning to engage in, in uh, these kind of problems. But we also have, in every computer game that my kids grew up with and are still around today, an image of a city like this. And maybe this is one of the reasons why architects don't have the influence and the voice that maybe they had in the 1930s. We are associated with producing this. And what I want to say is about the latter half of the 20th century, that it's the drive to individuation and the hero artist that gets fixated on form and the appearance of that form, not even the making of it. And that once there was a refusal in the earliest part of the 20th century to accept the status quo, but it's increasingly the refusal in the latter half and in the last two decades is to reflect the glory and the brilliance of the designers. And I'm not naming anyone. Um, some of them I like as people and I'm friendly with. But somehow when you look at the broader perspective, the obsession uh, with authorship has had a very destructive uh, uh, closing in of architecture on itself. And I think it's one of the reasons we don't have much of an audience. And we created cities without boundaries, surfaces without interiors. Somehow the intention to make good environments and nice spaces kind of got stripped out. And most famously, uh, there's a form of urbanism, parametric urbanism, if Theo will forgive me. Um, it's not his fault, um, which is kind of technically interesting. The public space is just the gaps left between buildings. Eisenman famously said in this room at a lecture that I intended when I was first teaching, and someone asked him, well, what about the public space? You've got all these nice shaped buildings. And he said, well, that's just the stuff left over between them. So uh, it a, was a fairly widespread and still is a fairly widespread uh, attitude amongst uh, important and leading architects who are very distinguished at other aspects of architecture but not at public space and not in the city. And everybody comes from somewhere else in the city, and nobody lives there. Um, nothing is grown or made. No one belongs. You buy the right through your job or through cash to be in a space, and you last there as long as you have sufficient power to purchase it. We've seen this very recently put forward by a leading architect as one of the ideas for reworking London and, and other European cities. Transients at the center of the city. I grew up a bit like that. My father was in the military. We moved around everywhere. I went to sea when I was 17. And I was in my late 20s before I met anyone and got to know them who'd spent their whole life in the same place that their parents had. And it was a terrible shock. And I think architecture needs this kind of shock, to realizing that we created an internal dialogue which is super interesting for us. We have drawings and models, and I find them as beautiful and as interesting as everyone else. 
but they have no resonance in the world. They have no purpose other than to talk to other architects. I want to say it's not hopeless, but before I do that, I want to ask a question, and particularly for the younger people here. When did we lose a conviction that architecture could improve human life? And why have we lost the ability to connect to people? And people are facing crises and catastrophes everywhere in the world, but we don't think their opinion is relevant. But it isn't hopeless although it's going to be your job to fix it rather than mine. Why? Well, first of all, the situation you're facing. World population is going to increase by 2050 to almost 10 million. Uh, this uh, forecast takes into account, this is the latest one uh, that's agreed between the World Bank, uh, the UN, uh, and all the leading researchers, and it takes into account falling birth rates. The birth rate now is about 1%. In 1914, it was over 2%. This is a natural biological phenomenon, all species do it. But even if we take that into account, m something like 50 to 60% of people live in cities. Now, the maths is quite simple. There's going to be at least 2,000 cities and possibly, depending on how big they are, somewhere between 20,000 and 2,000 cities built in your professional lifetime. 2050, those of you who are 25 now, are going to be the leading figures in the world of architecture. You're going to be leading practices, you'll be academics, professors, some of you, you'll have published works, you'll have buildings done and built. And a great part of your professional lives will be, the greatest opportunity will be on building cities. And they're being built without you. In China, they can build a city in 18 months. Start to finish, one built very re uh, a couple of years ago, and everybody laughed because it was kind of pink and ugly, and they said no one would ever go there, and today it's full. And none of the ideas from the past are relevant. They don't work, and I have tried to show you why. We also have very good projections of climate change. Very good models, from, not in architecture, but from outside, of what will be the impact. Which parts will be wetter, what will be drier, what will be the temperatures, where is water going to be short, where is food going to be easy to grow, and where it isn't. And the government, this is an economic forecast by Stern, uh, so th this is not some kind of fancy, um, you know, kind of making it up. Stern is one of the senior economists. It was actually commissioned by the British government, although they've chosen to ignore it, which is also a very British thing to do. Um, and, and our current government says, well, who, we'll pay, pay for someone to do it, and it's all very serious, and when they produce it and they don't like it, they say, well, who needs a fucking expert? Um, sorry about the language. But, uh, okay. But there are good signs, there are promising things. This is Madrid. Madrid, uh, many of you won't know, but if you were in Madrid uh, 25 years ago, the center of the city was just this enormous uh, brown stuff with cars moving at really high speeds right through the middle of it. And you could not cross in the center of the city from one side to the other. And every apartment building, all the parkland was brown, and you could not open a window in any of the buildings because of the hydrocarbon fumes. And whether you like the scheme or not, it uh, um, was very, I think, well done to restore the river. It used to be buried in the cars on top, and they've kind of reversed that, put the cars on the ground at the side. It was a landscape project that's 14 kilometers long right through the city, in one side and out the other, because Madrid's not a huge city. And it's a, one of the first kind of European attempts to really reverse uh, or deal in a more ecological way with um, the consequences of the superhighways and so forth. A bit promising, but also a bit kind of funny. Uh, there are more and more schemes, and you will have seen many of them. I think Evolvo has tens of thousands of them, about ideas about green architecture. And more or less what they do is design a skyscraper in the normal way, and then 
Photoshop some green stuff on the outside. Uh, and but yeah, there's loads of them. If you Google it, you'll get this immense number of pages of uh, green green buildings. However, <coughs> I would say it's still although it's dumb as dumb as a bag of bricks. Or, there's a kind of promise in that, that people are beginning to think it has purpose and so forth. And this is San Francisco and there weren't two schemes apart from, you know, um, Photoshopping uh, um, the Frank Lloyd Wright thing of just, we've got one and we just make some more and put them all nice and separately. There's beginnings of ideas uh, of putting them together and reorganizing them, let's say. More seriously and along the lines of Katrina after hurricane, um, Sandy, I think it was, in New York, um, post-hurricane Sandy, it was a very serious and very well-funded design competition. Uh, I'm going to show two of the little pro projects for it. They're ongoing. They are, in some sense, going to be built. Uh, so um, this is one kind of reimagining re and reworking. Uh, MTech is doing a study on another one, and this, I think, was big, uh, the part of their proposal for Lower Manhattan. And the other promising thing for younger architects or for architects is that we have new tools. We can model analytically the way things are connected in cities, but we can also turn it into kind of more, more generative techniques. If we can find a way, we can start to look at the engineered landscapes of the world. Uh, this is from Almeria part of Spain, if you had tomatoes in your breakfast sandwich or your lunch sandwich today, this is where they came from. You'll see if you fly into Rotterdam, these enormous territories of land in and close to cities that are uh, w w producing our vegetables and a great part of our food. They're not yet urbanized, and yet there's an incipient urban, urban organization within them. And they have uh, a periodicity. They're largely unoccupied for four to five months of the year. They're not artificially conditioned. Many of them in southern Spain, you don't need to. Um, and they're very simple structures, but they make these strange landscapes. If there was a way to unite that with, we have an inheritance of engineered landscapes, very carefully managed, ecologically very, very brilliant and beautiful ways of retaining and holding water, stabilizing hillsides. The mathematics of climate are very well known. These are mathematical equations uh, that are to do with different aspects of uh, environmental behavior on urban blocks and urban tissues. Been studied for 50 years, not by architects, um, but, uh, and we can put those to work this is uh, within evolutionary computation, and start to imagine ways of including what has always been analysis into a generative process. That is, you can put it at the beginning and embed it within the way you think about things. We have ways of modeling uh, dynamics. These are two aspects of a uh, Mekon River, uh, winter and summer, and we can not a model of velocity as a, as a number, but as a vector and direction. We can put them to work. We can pre-calculate and design uh, blocks in various ways. We can pre-select. This is a slightly older uh, way of doing things. And what that algorithm is doing is from a number of blocks that have been designed and the performance calculated, selecting what are the most appropriate to put next to each other and how to unite them into some kind of network. Maybe I'll stop that because you kind of see the principle and it kind of opens up connections between them. More interestingly, we can start to produce, this is not optimization because there are whole families of these going on. But we can look at the performances as just openness. The scientific name is Skyview Factor. Not terribly good name for something that's really crucial, uh, but the openness to the sky. We can couple that, almost couple it, and I'm making kind of slight 
slightly claim too far in some ways, but these are all kind of, at the moment, slightly separate ways of generating and analyzing. This is actually a real energy model for Chicago, uh, produced by uh, SOM and, um, uh, and, uh, and another practice. And some of it's kind of slightly secret, but uh, the local government have a dynamical model of the energy fluctuations hour by hour, day by day, of the buildings in the center of the city. And we are trying to develop an MTEC, which is from uh, current year, what in mathematics is called a regression analysis, it's kind of fancy name for what happens if you put something here? We can model the flow down a hillside and see if it's stable, but if I put something there, that changes it. And we can use these things to, we can build simulations which are projections into the future. And it takes a great deal of effort, but the fact that it can be done in a school on a laptop is really quite extraordinary. And there's a number of uh, explorations of different scenarios and what their effects will be uh, on uh, the landscape, water flows, and so forth. We have ways of kind of modeling uh, urban growth of evolving it in this case with the morphology and the canals growing simultaneously and influencing each other. But we have a lot of unanswered questions. And what's also lacking is the still, is the social ambition, the qualities of space, the ways of thinking about how people will live in, in these future things. And there are new questions that come up. What does that mean? We have ways or we have questions and the world has ways of using public spaces are uh, collated uh, Twitter maps from people's movements and there are loads of different kinds of people running, people taking photographs, ways of understanding the dynamics of cities, not in the other ways I've just shown, but actually through people's behavior, through their smartphones, through their media presence. And these are extraordinary, but nobody quite knows what it means. And I don't think anybody, including, I have no idea what public space is when I think about these behavioral patterns. There are new patterns. It's old fabric. This is the kind of paradox. It's old fabric. You know, they're moving through stuff that's been there, in some cases, for hundreds of years. But the way they use it and the way it happens, the behavior is different. So what I want to say to you, those of you who are I don't want to be ageist about this color, so I'm including you. But mainly for the generation between 25 and 30. In some ways, you are in a very similar situation to Santilia. You have exploding technologies which are, nobody quite knows how it's going to play out or what the effects will be. You have social pressures, demographic pressures. You still have a large, very large number of <coughs> the disenfranchised and the dispossessed. The numbers are tens of times, in orders of magnitude higher than Santeria faced, but you have much greater tools and much greater capacities. And the greatest advance you have, I think, is the dynamics, the ways of thinking about time where you don't have to know the answer in advance where it's not your sole opinion, I think it's going to be like this, but ways of exploring dynamics, of how things can change, modeling them over time. There's greater understanding of the natural world, from the very small to the enormously large. Of course, none of that knowledge resides in architecture schools or in architectural communities. And you will only use it and find it if you turn your face and your intention to the world outside of academia and outside of the profession. And it's amazing, you know, that, that people want to help and cooperate. You know, when I, I was at school like Carlos, you know, architects work like that. Or you stayed home for three days, worked like a demon, pilled with it, put your drawing up on the wall and kind of tried to look all casual. But, um, you know, and he, he didn't really explain how you did it or what it really meant. Uh, or if you did, it was a kind of architectural babble that you couldn't remember the next day, um, and nor could anyone else. And the culture then was make the beautiful drawing and you know, we'll talk about it. So we have to turn away from 
the second half of the 20th century, from the media sphere of architectural discourse on the city. In my view, this will lead you nowhere. Most of it is gibberish. The bits that are good were invented 50 years before that. And what I want to ask you and say to you, your job is to make the new city, to dream it, design it, draw it, speculate on it, put forward ideas. Santilia could not possibly have anticipated that his dream would have been built in the way that it has, but it does. And the extraordinary thing is that many of those ideas were expressed in a few drawings and a model. And the text sometimes is, you know, you're hard pushed to get it to cover two pages. But the brilliance of it, the putting forward the dream and the calculation together persists and has a profound effect on the world. And so I want to invite you to dream and speculate and design a new city for your generation. Thank you. Okay, uh, there's an obligatory part where I have to answer some questions. Um, okay, yeah, I, I will a few, and then we're, there's a few drinks, I think, in, uh, in the South Jury Room, uh, where we can have kind of maybe more relaxed conversations. I'm not going to cross my arms because then I'm getting defensive. So. Um, you were talking about how emergent technologies and our new uh, advantage of getting more knowledge and more simulation is a great advantage. But um, like personally, I'm still a student and I just uh, went into computation and simulations and stuff like that. But don't you think the more complex uh, this whole process becomes uh, the less we know about so many unexpected things. I mean, if in the first place we are not being able to define a public space. Someone defines it as an indoor space, others define it as the negative space or the void in the city. With all these simulations, how is it a new definition or is it a mutation of the old undefined definition? I mean, I I'm, I'm kind of lost about this a little bit? Well, and I, I think you and the, and the rest of the world is lost about it. <laughs> I don't think we have any viable good ideas of what urban space is. However, as architects, we can make what uh, the well-tempered environment. We can make things in deserts that are well-shaded and cool. We can make things in the Arctic that are, are warm. Uh, we can keep our feet dry in, in the marshes. We can do a lot, and in a way, what I want to be saying to you is many of these things are not so difficult to learn. Give a year of your life for two years and you'll be as good as anybody else. But what can't be taught, what cannot be taught, is the willpower to make your dream visible, to make your arguments, to study, you know, to find new definitions of space, to find new patterns and morphologies that are going to be resonant, and to couple them to the needs of the world. That the, what I want to put to you is that these should not be addressing the media sphere and the uh, internal dialogues of architecture. Your mother should be able to understand it, or your auntie. Show your auntie any architectural magazine from the last 20 years. And ask, watch, just watch their face, you know. It's babble. It means nothing to anyone else. We know it, we understand it, we live it. And we can go on doing it as long as we're also doing something that is important for the world, that is going to make a difference. There is no fixed solution, the very thing that worries you is also your most positive feeling. There's nothing that anyone can tell you or teach you. We can teach you methods, we can encourage you to think. 
But my, my argument is that you have to do it. Because I don't see anything in the last 50 years that is just except weaker, maybe bigger uh, repetitions and inversions and distortions of the ideas that came from 1940, 1914 to 1935. We need those new ideas. It's a bit of a rant, isn't it? I, I should calm down a little bit. So. Mm. That's the trouble with these kind of doing these kind of things. Eh? Maybe we'll talk more informally. Yeah. Uh, I think. Thank you. All.